that he makes sense out of the nonsense that we pray, along with our mediator, Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that when we pray, even when we don't know what to say, you're there for us and you you put in, you put fill in the blanks that we're missing. And Lord, I thank you for that. Uh, open our minds today to just comprehend how wonderful the person of the Holy Spirit is. Uh, may he be our teacher to illumine our minds, to shed the light on the, the Word of God and Lord, such a way that it resonates with me and where I live. Uh, we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again to the Holy Spirit, who He is, and what He does. Those are our two main themes, who He is and what He does. And so we'll break this down under those two major categories. To begin with who He is, the Holy Spirit is a person. This is so important. It was one of the early church uh, councils. They settled what the whole concept of the Trinity because there are some in the ancient world, there were some who did not believe in the Holy Spirit as a trinity, especially those who were modalists. Uh, they didn't see him as being a person. Some saw him as a force or a power, but not as a person. So we're going to establish that he is. This is demonstrated by the fact that he possesses the characteristics of personality. Now, we've been saying that personality involves an intellect. Okay? Person, anybody who's a person has personality, they have to know something. You've got to have that power of intellect. Um, today's is the very last page in there. Just, there you go. Yep. Okay. So he has intellect. Uh, who can know the mind of the Lord except the Spirit of Christ? I believe that's what it says in 2, 10, 11. He has emotions, okay? Uh, we have references to the, the emotion, grieve not the Holy Spirit. Oh, he's grievable, so he has emotions, all right? And uh, I'm not sure that's what that passage says, but it might say that something about love because i got a heart there. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, he has a will. He, he chooses to give the gifts to whom he chooses. I don't get to pick the gifts. <laughs> you know, sometimes you go to these seminars and you kind of give you a list and you kind of pick what you think. Oh, it doesn't work that way. You don't pick what you want. He gives you, okay? It's his choice. He chooses the gifts, all right? Uh, it's also demonstrated by the fact that he's a person is that he does what only a person can do. Now, one of the things he does is he creates. This chair, which is non-personal, can't create anything, all right? Uh, it, it takes a person with intellect to plan and to develop and to create. He teaches, John 14, 26. You've got to be a person to teach, okay? We might learn a lesson from something in life, but it does not, it's not a teacher. Um, <clears throat> he testifies. He bears witness. The person bears witness, okay? And then uh, we go down, he convinces. He makes arguments so crystal clear that you are convicted. <laughs> yep, I'm convicted. He, he makes the case. And we'll, we'll look at that case that he makes here a little later, all right? But that's what a person does. A person does all these things. He intercedes. He's the go-between between, between two parties. Uh, he intercedes for us. And uh, so what we have here is, is all these facts that <clears throat> it's not just a power or a, a force. You know, like in Star Wars, may the force be with you. you no, know, he's not just a force. He is a person. We have a personal God. The fact that he is treated as a person, uh, for, for example, he is blasphemed. You can blaspheme the Holy Spirit, Matthew 12, 31. And by blaspheme, I got the name of the, the Lord there on the screen, and now I'm going to blaspheme. I, I'm going to throw mud at the name of God. Oh. See, that's what I've just done on that screen. And that's what blasphemy is, okay? You're, you're discrediting God. You're blaspheming him. He, he can be blasphemed, okay? So... Uh, he is also lied to. I can't lie to this chair. Okay, I can't lie to uh, an energy, a, a lightning bolt. That's energy. Okay, I, I can't. I, I can't lie to that. I lie to a person. Um, <clears throat> he is resisted. Okay, it tells us in Acts seven fifty one they resisted the Holy Spirit, pushing him away. They push away the Holy Spirit, and. Uh, <clears throat> that happens often. I had a friend of mine that said that when he was at these revival meetings back in the day when the church evangelists went around and did revivals, he was sitting there and he was preaching. He said he was so deeply convicted 
he was hanging on to the pew in front of him till it, squeezing it so hard, his knuckles were all turning white. I mean, because he was resisting the, the invitation to go and receive Christ. Okay, He was resisting. You can resist. He is grieved. We already mentioned that, the fact that he's treated us person. He's grieved. We'll mention that several times, though. The, the fact that he is referred to by personal pronouns. Personal pronouns. Now, <clears throat> he is called he. And who. Versus actually being called it. Now, this is really important. Or what? You know, he who, personal pronouns are used for him. This is really, really important because, but by, by the fact that he's referred to as personal pronouns, it's, it's most interesting because the Greek word spirit, which is pneuma, we get pneumonia from this, spirit, your breath, okay? Pneuma is neuter. In Greek, you have every word, every noun is either masculine, feminine, or neuter. This word is neuter, so any pronoun used with it, so you know what the antecedent, you would, referring to the wind, you would say it. And it would require a neuter pronoun, it. But in John 15, 26, when Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit coming, he uses the masculine pronoun he is used for the Holy Spirit, him. In John 16, 17, the masculine Relative pronoun who is used <clears throat> for him. So we know by Jesus' vocabulary, he refers to the Holy Spirit as being a person and not a thing. Not a power, not a force, but he is a person. So he's the person of the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is a person and not a force or an energy, but a person who thinks, feels, and makes choices. Therefore, he is personally involved in our lives. He's involved in our lives. Okay? And the point is, we grieve him because he's a person anytime we sin. We grieve the Holy Spirit. That's kind of mind boggling. I, I just take my sins for granted, I embellish a story to favor me. I lied. Isn't that a nice way of saying it? I embellished the story? Oh, yeah, yeah. That doesn't sound like <clears throat> Yeah, and so he's grieved that I would do that. That I would be afraid of the truth. That I wouldn't depend on him to even admit to the truth. Okay? He's grieved. He's grieved. Every time we sin, he's grieved. Oh, my goodness. That's just mind-boggling. The Holy Spirit is God. If he's a person, he's also God. We said he's second person of the Trinity. <laughs> He's identified as God. Oh, I forgot to make this a dark font, but it says, You have lied to the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. Ananias and Sapphira came in and they were giving their offering and they said that they'd given all. And it says here, Oh, no, you didn't. You have lied to the Holy Spirit. What do you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men. Okay, you lied to the Holy Spirit. You have not lied to men, but you've lied to God. So, to lie to the Holy Spirit is to lie to God himself. And that's what the, the passage here is. He's identified as God. Uh, God the Holy Spirit. He possesses divine characteristics of God also. Uh, for example, he's called the eternal spirit in Hebrews 9.14. So he has eternality, such as God has. He has omniscience. He knows the mind of God. He, he, he knows the mind of God. He, he's omniscient. He's omnipresent, Psalm 139, 7. You cannot escape the Spirit of God. Anywhere you go, He is there. <clears throat> he's called the Spirit of Holiness in Luke 11, 13. Uh, he's the Spirit of Truth in John 5, 6. And He's the Spirit of Life. He's the Life Giver in Romans 8, 2. Now, these are all attributes that God has, all characteristics of God that He has. And uh, we might have some of them to a limited degree, but he has them to the divine degree. All right, did you get all those, or was I too fast? Okay. I'm going to take a little sip. All right. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit also bears the title of deity. In the Bible, he's called the Spirit of God. Genesis 1-2, 1 
<clears throat> and the Spirit was uh, upon the face of the deep. He was the Spirit of God. <clears throat> In Luke 4.18, He's the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's given a title of deity. <clears throat> he's called the Spirit of Christ in Romans 8.9. The Spirit of Christ. He's called the Spirit of Jehovah or the Lord in Judges uh, 3.10. This is lowercase, the Spirit of Adonai, the Spirit of Yahweh or Jehovah. And so these are all names of God. He is called the Spirit of the Living God in 2 Corinthians 3.3. And with the, you know, the adjective modifying there, living God. Okay, he's the living God. So, but we have all these these titles bear witness to the fact that he is he's God. He also performs which God can only do. We've already talked about creation. He is the creator God, Genesis 1-2. He's involved in the creation of this world. <clears throat> John 3-6, he, he imparts spiritual life, the new birth. You're born of the water and of the word. You're born of the Spirit of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That which is flesh is flesh. That which is a spirit is spirit. You're born of the Spirit of God. And we'll look a lot more at that when we get a little further into it. He's the God of Revelation. It was the Holy Spirit that revealed many things in the Scriptures uh, to the prophets. And then the prophets then passed those on to us. So he performs a work which only God can do. <clears throat> He also is the God of superintendents. By that, he superintended the, the prophets. So the words that they wrote were the exact words that God wanted written down so that my Bible is the Word of God. And so he's the one who is involved in, in, in developing the, the Word of God. And so the Holy Spirit is God. He's doing the work of God. <clears throat> now, I'm going to change, shift gears here. Okay, he's a person. He's a personal person, and he's God. So God, I can have a personal relationship with the true and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's the Trinity. Now the symbols of the Holy Spirit, there are several of used in scriptures. <clears throat> Excuse me. First one is clothing. In Luke 24, 49, the symbol here is putting on the power of God. And it's referring to when the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to put on this power of God. And so... He says, I am going to send what my Father has promised, but stay here in the city until you have been clothed with the power from on high. On the day of Pentecost, that happened. Okay? The Holy Spirit came, and tongues of fire were over their heads, right? Mighty rushing wind, and they were clothed with power from on high. So there's a symbol of the presence of God. We're enveloped in Him. We're clothed in Him. The next one is a deposit, the next symbol the Bible uses. <clears throat> Well, they're not in any real order, but the symbol of a pledge that more of the Father's promise will come. So in 1 Corinthians 1.22, it says, Now it is God who makes, us, makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He has anointed us and set his seal of ownership upon us, and he's put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. <clears throat> when the Holy Spirit invaded my body, I was eight years old and I accepted Jesus as my Savior. The Holy Spirit invaded my body. That was the down payment, the presence of the Spirit, guaranteeing there's much more to come. Okay? And so God is not done with me. I like that. Don't you like that? God's not done with any of us. And, and He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's the down payment. But there's much more to come. <clears throat> there's a symbol of the dove. A symbol of gently and peacefully coming from heaven. We find that in Matthew 3, 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God. There's that title, remember? Spirit of God of deity. Descending like a dove and lighting on him. And so he, here's a symbolism uh, where we get to use the Holy Spirit, or the dove is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now, it doesn't say a real dove came down upon him. Do you notice that? It says the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. Now like means it looks like, it behaved like, but it doesn't say it was a dove. All right. So there was a theophany there, a manifestation. This is, there's, there's few of these I read in the scriptures. A few pneumophanies, that is pneuma, spirit, fanny, appearance, where the Holy Spirit actually appears. The flame of fire, tongues on their head. Another one, the rushing wind. Every now and then we, we get a 
a visible manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, uh, but there, we don't find many of them. Mostly they're theophanies or Christophanies. All right. There's fire in Acts chapter 2, verse 3. The symbol, of, this is of the Lord's presence. We were just talking about that. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And so this tongue of fire, and, and the whole theme of the fire takes me all the way back to the Old Testament, that uh, when the tabernacle was set up, there was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And that day, a symbol of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God being with them, a fire, and then he manifested in these <clears throat> revelatory expressions coming from everybody that were that they were enabled by the <coughs> holy fire uh, coming upon them, and they, they began to speak in foreign languages. That's what this means, other tongues, foreign languages. They spoke to people over there. We talked about that on last uh, Pentecost Sunday. <clears throat> the symbol of the Holy Spirit of anointing oil. It's a symbol of setting apart for service. When Aaron the high priest was anointed for service, they poured oil on his head. And the one psalm talks about how it dripped down into his beard. So they really gave it to him. Okay, It wasn't just a little dot on the head. He, he, they, they, but they set him apart to be the high priest. Okay. In Acts 10.38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. So God anointed him. Now, many believe that was taking place at the baptism when the Holy Spirit came down from above and lighted on him. He was being anointed with the Holy Spirit and power. And how he went about doing good, healing all who were under his power, the uh, power of the devil, because God was with him. Now, this is referring to the man Jesus. He's being anointed and God was with him. It's just a powerful passage. You know the thing I like about it most? It's right in the center. When you're anointed, you go about doing good. You just do good. Isn't it great? People who have the anointing of the Spirit on them, they're going to do good. They're going to do good. All right? And John 1, 20 and 27, but you have an anointing, referring to the Holy Spirit, from the Holy One, the Father, or, or, or anointing from the Holy One, the Holy Spirit, and all of you know the truth. As for you, the anointing you receive from Him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as His anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing, I missed one making it red, is real in that counterfeit. There's a ministry of the Holy Spirit in this anointing so that you don't need anyone to teach you. You are taught by the Spirit. Isn't that amazing? If you were a castaway on an island all by yourself and there was nobody else around and a plane flying over, okay, you're on this little island, it's just you, nobody else, plane flies over and out of the plane fell a Bible, boom, and it lands in your lap. And you start reading the Bible, the Holy Spirit, once He regenerates your heart, He will guide you into the truth. You don't need anyone else to come up with the truth in the Holy Spirit. Now, God has given to the church pastors, teachers, and other people, all right, who have spent a full-time occupation studying the Word to help and guide you who don't have the time to do that full-time all the time yourself. And so, but you will know if you read the Bible, you know, if you got your Bible there. My wife brings her Bible every week. She sits there and she checks out everything I'm doing. She writes in it. She marks it. And if I were to say something wrong, she would tell me later, you know you didn't get that right. <laughs> she would. She would. How does she, she, she say, you know, that, every time, now and then, she'll say, you know, I just don't agree with your interpretation on that. And you know what? There are times when the other person in my life, not just her, other people, said, oh, I don't think that's exactly what I said. I studied over. I said, you know what? I didn't quite have that right. I think you're right. Why? But he never tells me I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you laid yourself over for that one. <laughs> I get away with this in a testosterone rich environment. <laughs> the whole point of this is you have as much the Holy Spirit as I do. 
You get that Bible out, you read it, and God will speak to you. He will speak to you. He will teach you. And I, I, it's not like I have, I, I think I've just probably spent more time studying it than you have. That's the only difference. That's the only difference. Because you have the Holy Spirit is equally as much as I do, and He is equally your teacher, and He will equally open up your eyes, and you can equally come to the truth. And so, you guys don't even need me. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you get the point, right? It's not, it's not that anybody else has the de definitive truth. God has a definitive truth. And you have everything you need with the Holy Spirit to come to the truth. You have everything. He gives an anointing Could we to you. at least use your slides? Pardon? <laughs> Could we at least use your slides? Oh, yeah. <laughs> he wants the slides and he's going to have to teach us. All right. The next one is a seal. The seal is a symbol of ownership, of authority, security, and a finished transaction. All those things are summed up in that term seal. Ownership. You know, when Jesus was uh, crucified, they buried him in the, in the tomb, and the Bible says they sealed the tomb. We still do that today. When there's a crime scene somewhere, they seal it off with that tape that goes around. The Romans stretched a rope across it, and they put a seal on each side where they embedded the, the Roman seal in it on both sides, but held the rope across it, and that was the same thing that we do in a crime scene, okay? It's sealed, saying, hey, this area is now owned by the Roman Empire. You're, you, you can't trespass. You trespass against our authority. We have the authority. We have the right to command you to stay out of here. What's my right? And they pull out their sword. It's right here. You see, have you seen the cross? That's our right. Okay. And so they have the right, and it's for security. We're keeping this area secure. That's what they're doing. And then it's a final transaction. It's been sealed. It's sealed with the Roman seal saying, you violate this, you got the Roman government against you. Now, take that over. Now, whole transition over. The Holy Spirit is the seal. The fact that the moment I got saved, I was invaded by the Holy Spirit means that presence of the Holy Spirit is the seal that God owns me. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's the seal. He is that I belong to God. Authority, he is the authority. Not me, he's the authority. Secure, I am eternally secure in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit who sealed me not because of anything I'm doing, but because I got to see the Holy Spirit. I am secure. I am backed up by God Almighty, and He has finished the transaction. The Holy Spirit's presence says, done deal. All right? Now, now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, poured the oil on us, of the Holy Spirit, and set His seal of ownership on us, and put His Spirit in our hearts, as the deposit guaranteeing what is to come. He is the seal that I belong to God. You know, when the eyes run of the Lord says, run to and fro through all the earth, another passage says, he doesn't look on the outward appearance as man looks, but he looks on the heart. When God looks through the whole earth, and as I see, whoops, that one belongs to me. <laughs> I own that as why? The Holy Spirit's in me. He invaded me the moment I got saved. I belong to him. I am a I have his authority of that right here in his word. It's a done deal. I belong to him. Isn't that great? I belong to him. We have the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> There's a symbol of the water. It's a symbol of genuine, total satisfaction of mankind's basic needs. Satisfaction of basic needs. And I get that from this passage in John 7, 8, uh, 38 through 39. Jesus said, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of water will flow from within him. By this, he meant the Spirit. Jesus is telling us what it means. So this water flowing, he says, is a metaphor of the Spirit of God, whom those who believe in him were later to receive. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came, rivers of living water flowing in him. Up to that time, the Spirit had not yet been given since Jesus had not been glorified. Okay? So... And the next one is a symbol of the wind. It's invisible, immaterial, and a sovereign nature. In John 3, 8, this is what he says, okay? The wind blows wherever it pleases. And you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. And so is everyone born of the Spirit. The Spirit has, like the wind, his own freedom of movement. 
sure. But that's all of those symbols, right? There may be more. I, those are the ones I've captured from the scriptures. The focus of his ministry, I want to turn to that now. <clears throat> the ministry of the Holy Spirit always exalts Jesus and not himself. The Holy Spirit always exalts Jesus. This is where I have a difficulty with some of the charismatic movement. They exalt the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit of the of the, the Holy Spirit's ministry is to always exalt Jesus. And so, if I'm focused on the Holy Spirit and exalting Him, I'm missing the whole point of His ministry. His ministry is to point to Jesus and exalt Jesus. And I know that from the Scriptures, John 15:26, the Spirit of Truth who goes out from the Father, He will testify about Me. The job of the Holy Spirit is to point to Jesus. To point to Jesus. Our worship experience here at church should always ultimately focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? We focus on the fact that the Father sent Him, that it was Jesus that was sent, who died for us. The Holy Spirit is the one that regenerated us so that we are in the family of God and that Jesus is our Savior. And it's always going to come back to Jesus. And that's what the ministry of the Holy Spirit said. He's going to testify about me. That's His role, that's His ministry to testify about the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the ministry of the Holy Spirit always exalts Jesus. John 16, 13. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will not speak on His own. He will only speak what He hears, and He will tell you what, it, what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me. Jesus, listen. What He does, going to focus on me. That's going to be His role. He's always going to focus on the Savior. He's going to, he will bring glory to me by taking uh, from what is mine and making it known to you. He's going to focus on what is what Jesus is to all of us. That's his ministry. Question. Yeah. So the Spirit's always going to focus on Jesus. Yes. And then Jesus basically always focused on God. Yes. Right? Uh huh. Okay, so that's where yeah. God is the. That's the Father. Top of the triangle, right, the Father and yeah, the it, Son. It's a little confusing because we speak of God as the Father, we speak of God as the entire essence, the being. <clears throat> so it gets a little confusing because we don't normally just say Father, we say God the Father. And so well, sometimes I'm saying, when well, God, I'm really speaking about the Father without saying God the Father. <clears throat> and so, but there is, there's a tri tri Trinity relationship there. And ontologically, that is by being of existence, they're all co-equal, co-eternal, okay? But in an economic way, to work out time, the Father sent the Son, the Son was sent by the Father. The Father didn't have to die for us, the Son did. So there is a, to work out a plan of creation and redemption, they assumed different roles, but they're all co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent. They're all, all that at the same time, which is really mind-boggling for all of us, I know. I, I'm not sure that I get my head all the way around it, but that's what the Scriptures teach, and, and we accept it. That's all part of our faith. So i got a discussion question here. <clears throat> How would you describe the Holy Spirit to an unchurched person? Here's a person that's come from a third world country. I don't know, maybe they're Muslims, Buddhists, or animists, or you know, whatever. And you're going to explain the Holy Spirit. What would you say? This person knows nothing. Everybody has a soul. And when you accept oh. Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into your soul. Okay. And then you're sealed. Uh, okay. The Holy so he's invisible. He's like my, my soul is invisible. It's yeah. like a deed. Okay. Somebody else? Um, the Holy Spirit resides within you so that you may love other people through Him. God is love. Good, good. How else might you describe the... Here's the unchurched person. Who's the Holy Spirit? To me, the Holy Spirit is a feeling... And to describe it, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, it's a feeling of being overwhelmed by the love of God. So it's like if you're feeling sad or happy or angry, those are all feelings. The whole spirit is a feeling that I have. It's hard. It's hard. This is very hard. It's very hard. We're talking about an invisible entity. Go ahead. Well, <clears throat> I guess I would say he's part of the Trinity. 
and he is God also, equally with God, and that he's our teacher. Okay. So, well, those, these are all good. I don't think there's any of them wrong. It's just, I would say, okay, here's a totally unchurched person. I would say, hey, you feel the wind? Can you see it? Mm -hmm. The Bible tells us that he's like the wind. He's invisible. And yet he comes within a person and he resides in them when they believe in Jesus. And he does a whole bunch of things. And I could just start listing the ones that we just talked about. He teaches you, instructs you, he turns on the light so you understand. And you just go down through those kinds of things. But it's but it's a person. It's not like the wind just a force. It's a person. And the person is God. I don't know. You see what? This is a hard thing. To, how do we teach children about We hope that they get to an age where they can abstractly think so that they can put abstract thoughts together because there's nothing in this world we can really compare a trinity to. We just do the best we can. Go ahead. Sometimes I, I feel the Holy Spirit is like my conscience telling me what I should yeah. or shouldn't do and reminding me of what I should do. That's very interesting because this is, this is really where theology gets hard. I have a conscience. But is my conscience the Holy Spirit, or does my whole, does the Holy Spirit prod my conscience? And then I got to ask myself: Was that a prodding of the Holy Spirit, or was that just my guilty conscience? <laughs> All right? Or you know, because the conscience is that part of me. We'll learn this under when we look at what man, how man is composed. My conscience is that part of me that passes judgment on what I do or say or act or feel. It, 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 it's that part of me that judges myself. And so my own conscience can, it can be a real tricky thing. My conscience can say, when I compare myself to others, I can say, well, I'm not as bad as Roger over here. <laughs> All right? And so I excuse myself with my conscience, or I can accuse myself, oh my goodness, I'll never live up to the way a lot Roger is. And I start accusing. My conscience, see, whatever I do in my life, that is that part of my, my self-judgment on all my thoughts, actions, and deeds, all, everything. And so sometimes, okay, I have my conscience, the Holy Spirit pricks my conscience. That's what you're after. The Holy Spirit. So that I feel guilty for not counting my change and saying they overpaid me and I got this extra money and that I didn't go back and give it to them. Okay? Because it's going to take me all this time. i got to go back. i got to explain the whole thing. They're going to say, I don't know what to do with it. And so you say, and it's about my, my conscience that doesn't let me sleep at night. That I should have gone back and given that money anyway. All right? Is the Holy Spirit the one that keeps priding that, triggering that my conscience will do that? I, I, I'm inclined to think so. Yes. I think so, too. I think it's just like your conscience. It says that I will send you a helper. Yes, exactly. And it prods and, and touches that. So for a person that's not saved, that still does the right thing, yeah. that's their conscience. That's just their conscience. Because the Holy Spirit is what we have as believers. Yes. Yes. And <clears throat> the conscience, very interesting thing. We're not going to study it in here, but I've studied this before because it's an area of interest to me. <clears throat> Your conscience can get seared, the Bible said. What is seared? Burn. Burn. You burn it and it's calloused and hard so that a really evil, wicked person like Hitler, okay, and his henchmen that were slaughtering the Jews, they had seared consciences so that the normal person, their conscience says, oh my goodness, you can't do that to people. But their conscience is so seared, burned, that they do those things, okay? And that's just uh, evil criminal minds are like that. Somebody else have their hand up. Yeah? I thought it would be a good idea to go back to, the, uh, to telling that person that in the Bible about Pentecost and how, that, how uh, even what happened at that time where the Holy Spirit came into the people and, uh, or onto them, but helped them to speak different languages and so Empowered. that they was a teacher, yes. uh, is a teacher to us and was a teacher to the people then. Very good. I think the more we, we prod, we will come up with even more things. We can do this. We can communicate these truths. Next one, from the different symbols of the Holy Spirit, which intrigues you the most and why? You can look at your books. Which one of those intrigues you the most? Symbols of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. 
The fire. The fire? The question then was why? Well, the fire came down, showed itself to Moses. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have the Pentecost fire. Yeah. What was the other one you mentioned? Uh, the, the, the pillar of cloud the divided pillar, right, right, pillar right. of fire. And it was a pillar of fire that stood between Pharaoh and the Hebrews. Yes. Um, it was light to the Hebrews and darkness. Yes. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And, it, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's so present. And we can have a campfire. We, we know what fire is. Yeah. But it, mystical. it didn't consume the bush. Yeah. It certainly was huge and, and didn't consume anything when it stood between Pharaoh and the, the Hebrews. Because yeah. I don't know, I wasn't there, but I'm assuming there probably was nothing there to burn. Right. It, the, the water and the sand yeah. made a lot of glass, maybe. I don't know. It is very intriguing. And I think if you explore these, you'll be really intrigued. Mm -hmm. You know, these, 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 all these metaphors. <coughs> That's why and you've it, always been a fire bug. And, and we all know fire. <coughs> yes, we all know fire. We and it can be destructive or, or it can be constructive. Helpful. Yes, right. we can use it to our benefit, yeah. warmth, yeah. energy, right. but it can hurt you. These are very good. Oh, I'm glad I didn't have a third one. I want to get in there. <laughs> <laughs> all right, here we go. The Holy Spirit, who he is and what he does. We just looked at who he is. Now I want to turn to what he does. All right. The ministry of the Holy Spirit for our study is going, we're going to focus on uh, four different aspects. All right, I got them here. His grace ministry, his Old Testament ministries, and his ministry to the life of Christ, and then finally his New Testament ministries. I'd kind of like to race through the first three so we got time for that last one, okay? The New <coughs> Testament ministries, which will take just a little bit more time. So once you got these jotted down, All right, if you don't look on your neighbor's paper at this point. <laughs> we'll now study just these first three before I, I'll take a little question time break again. His grace ministry, grace means unmerited favor. We went through the book of Galatians. We know that that's what it means, unmerited favor. So grace is absolutely free. So God is giving us free gifts, and uh, therefore his grace ministries of the Holy Spirit are considered grace from two different aspects. Uh, the first one is called common grace. Common grace. It's not like common sense, is it? Common sense is not like common. <laughs> <laughs> common grace is not like common sense. Common grace, you're going to see, is everywhere. It's grace that is common to all mankind. Sinners, righteous, doesn't matter who you are. God is showing you grace. Everyone gets grace. All right. Efficacious grace is grace that effectively moves people to believe in Jesus. That effectively, it effectuates that person. When God shows this grace, you act on it. You 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 act in a certain way. It's effective. So we got common. It's just general out there everywhere. And then we got efficacious grace. And so I'm going to talk about the common grace first. The good gifts of God to everyone includes the sunshine. All right. The sun shines. The Bible says on both the righteous and the unrighteous. So, that it's raining today, it didn't just rain at those homes where there's Christians on their gardens. It rains on the unrighteous garden too. And God is just being good to everyone. Everyone. It's a gift. He doesn't have to do that. He causes it to shine and to rain on the righteous and the unrighteous both. And so that God's just being good to all of his creatures. You know, he could hold the heavens back. He could just do that. But he knows we need that, and so he's good to give us the sunshine and the rain. All right. The other thing that he's good, that there's food from the earth. If I had an apple tree in my yard, which I don't, but if I had an apple tree in my yard and it produced apples, and a person next door to me is not a Christian, their apple tree would produce apples too. God is just good. All right? It's not, uh, it's just good to everyone. That should be a salad. Hmm? That should be a salad. Burger and fries. Oh, come on now. I want a French fry tree. <laughs> well, we're asking for trees. I want a money tree. <laughs> All right. Yeah, this for. Uh, goodness. All right. God, God is good. He's just good to his creation. Goodness. Um, kindness. 
God is kind. We go to another one here. He restrained sin. In Genesis 6, 6, 3, he is holding back. He's holding back sin from being its full-fledged, all-out worst condition. If God wasn't restraining sin right now, every person would be doing the worst that they could possibly do. That would be a terrible world to live in. But when he restrains sin, he restrains it for the benefit of everybody. Not just for the righteous. It's everybody's benefit. It's everybody's benefit. His restraint of sin includes three things. He restrained by the prophets. He sent the prophets, and when they preached the truth, it fell on not only believers' ears, but unbelievers' ears. Every Sunday when the gospel goes out and is preached across his land, and that doesn't just go to Christians, non-Christians hear it too. It goes to everybody. And there is a restraining force in that. And I don't get this. When I was in college, I worked as a carpenter's helper for one of the men in the church, at Green Baptist Church. And he told the workers there, hey, tomorrow I'm going to have the seminary student helping me here. And he said, came to me at lunchtime that day, my first day, and said, oh my goodness, I cannot believe this. Yesterday, all these women around here were cursing like sailors. And today, I haven't heard a single curse word. I think it's because you're a seminarian. <laughs> See, my very presence, knowing that, well, I'm a holy guy. You know I'm not, but they thought, I'm a holy guy, right? They cleaned up all their, the prophets, see, the prophets, the prophets have a restraining effect in what they say because of the message that they preach. Hey, the government, the government, the police restrain evil, okay? For the good people and the bad people, they benefit from it too. The saved and the lost. Everybody benefits from it. And God gives us, He's given us government for that very purpose. Boy, we believe our government's a mess, but just think what it would be like without a government at all. Right? So, the withholder. The Holy Spirit is called the withholder. He's holding back, in this passage, He's holding back the Antichrist and all of His wicked right, wickedness so that they're not as blown out of... So, so the earth is not so bad. So he's, he's the withholder. He does it by the general call of the gospel. Uh, many are, are called, but few are chosen. When, when I preach the word, I send it out every week. It goes to everybody. But the chosen are the ones that respond. But the general call goes to everyone. Everyone. That's God's common grace. He extends the call to everyone. Now, there's a deficiency in common grace. Although common grace restrains sin, and it does not provide regeneration. And the grace of sanctification. It does not guarantee that people will accept a Savior. It's just putting the message out there. <laughs> a friend of mine got saved working at the GM plant. I don't know which one here in Pontiac, but I was working on an assembly line years ago. And somebody on the line put a track on the product going down the line, and he picked it up. Uh -huh. He read the track and accepted Christ based on that track. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. Common grace. And purpose? The, yeah. common, the common grace that went down the line, and everyone, he picked it up. Everyone had the opportunity from that common grace, but only for him to become efficacious grace, become effective. That's the difference, okay? Common grace does not regenerate or sanctify. It takes a special saving grace. It doesn't, it doesn't regenerate a person. It doesn't sanctify a person. It's just God is good to all of creation. Now, the definition of efficacious grace is it is the work of the Holy Spirit that effectively moves people to believe in Jesus Christ the Savior. I was born a sinner. Okay, I was, that was passed on from Adam down to me. You did not have to teach me to do wrong. I knew that by nature. I was a selfish, self-centered person by nature. As a baby, I wanted it, and I wanted it my way. That was my nature. I had a sinful nature. If left to ourselves by nature, we will always choose to reject Jesus. We will. Because we suppress the truth always. My nature will tell me always to reject Jesus. So I need a special grace to turn that around. 
and that's called an effect, efficacious grace. There's two aspects of this efficacious grace. One is called conviction. The Holy Spirit, we talked about that. He convicts me of my sin. The Holy Spirit convicts me of that what I did was wrong. I'm a sinner. There's consequences for that, and I need a Savior. The Holy Spirit does that. My conscience would say, all right, yeah, what you did was wrong, but man, you're not as bad as... Roger. 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 <laughs> right? <clears throat> the Holy Spirit would prompt me to say, you're worse than Roger. You're the worst sinner of all. See? See how that works? The Holy Spirit <clears throat> is the one convicting me that I'm a guilty oh, sinner. Jesus. It takes that work of the Holy Spirit. Without that Holy Spirit, I'm going to accuse, I'm going to excuse my sin every time because that's what I do by nature. We'll talk about that more when we talk about the fallen sinful nature uh, in the next study. Not this study, the next study. The efficacious call is when God calls us. Now, the general call goes out and it's a preaching to everybody. And like, uh, but the call that we're talking about here is like a subpoena. Like, uh, you've been called and you better show up. You can't get out of this. You are showing up. All right? And so when God calls in the general call, it goes out to everybody. But when he convicts us and says, oh, you're guilty, you need to come to me and you need to do it right now. And you step out and you go to him because you've been subpoenaed. You've been summoned. He has worked within you. It's a special work of the Holy Spirit that is called effective work of the Holy Spirit, efficacious grace. Now, I want to look at some of this. The works of the Holy Spirit whereby he convinces a person beyond a shadow of a doubt of guilt regarding their sin. He talks about sin, that is sin of unbelief, that I don't believe, of righteousness, that Jesus Christ is the righteous one. And what he's convicting me of is judgment, because Satan is judged, therefore if he's judged, and I'm a sinner like Satan, there's a final judgment for sin for me too. And I get this all from in John 16, 8 through 11. I want to look at this passage, because it brings out exactly what the Holy Spirit convicts a person of. Watch this. In John 16, 8 through 11, it says, When he, that's the Holy Spirit, comes, he will convict the world of guilt regarding sin. He's going to convict the world of guilt regarding... I, I, the special grace, the gospel's going out, the guy next to him, the two equally sinful people, and he feels nothing, but this guy is convicted. The Holy Spirit is, is prompting and pointing his finger, prodding his conscience, and he comes to the conclusion... I am guilty regarding the sin in my life. The other guy, he doesn't get that. And he just blows it off. Says, I don't understand why you're wanting to go forward. Okay? Of righteousness, okay, that there is a standard of righteousness by which I am falling short. That's what's going on here. Because that's the consequence of that is judgment. I'm going to be judged. I'm going to be held accountable for my sin. I need a Savior. See, this is what's going on. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. He said, now, in regards to sin, it's because men do not believe in me. Ah, oh, it's the sin of unbelief. This guy is an unbeliever. I'm an unbeliever. But the preaching is going forth. The Holy Spirit is pricking my conscience that I'm guilty of my sin that I don't believe. I need to believe. And so an invitation is given. I respond and say, yes, I want to pray. I want to accept Jesus as my Savior. He says, because men do not believe in me. Next, regarding righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. I have access to heaven. You don't. I'm righteous. Because I'm going there, I'm the only one that can extend to you my righteousness. He says, and then he says, and in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. So it's the work of the Holy Spirit that is working in the conviction process when a, when a person is squirming because the truth is being preached and another person is not feeling anything. Well, the Spirit is at work in one person. And remember that passage? The Spirit goes where it desires like the wind. I cannot tell you when a person can get saved. can't do that. I preach the gospel like I'm, I'm a shotgun. I got a shotgun. Shoot. I hope it hits somebody. And then I hope the Holy Spirit uses it to work in that heart to create the faith. Because it's not up to me, the preacher. Okay. I can only do share the message. The work of the Holy Spirit that secures the voluntary obedience to the invitation to believe in Christ. It actually secures a voluntary obedience. They say, I'm guilty, and I'm responding, I'm confessing Jesus as my Savior. It secures that. You can look at all these passages. Uh, 
It's a divine summons. It's kind of like this. The general call goes everybody you believe. But the efficacious call is like, remember Lazarus, he had died, four days dead. They said he already stinks. That's what he said King James. He stinketh. And, and so they said, roll away the stone. Jesus then called out. This is an efficacious call. He says, Lazarus, come forth. Tell me, could he do anything other? No. You, how could it, how, he couldn't resist that. I mean, he was already dead. But Jesus summoned him with an efficacious call. He had to respond. And that's exactly what's going on here with the work of the Holy Spirit. When he convicts us, he summons us, we respond with faith. And had he not done that, I would have just relied on my own sinful human nature to reject every time. To reject every time. I need this work of the Holy Spirit in order for my, my salvation to take place. Any questions on that? Can I move on to the Old Testament now? I'm trying to go through. All right, let's go to Old Testament. The Holy Spirit's work in Old Testament is obviously a work in creation. We've talked about that a couple of times. His work of superintendence, all these passages talk about the Spirit of the Lord. Uh, actually, the, Lord, the Spirit of the Lord coming upon the prophet, that kind of thing, where, where he uh, prophesies and writes the scriptures. Um, his restraining sin in Genesis chapter 6, 3, he's holding back sin. In fact, in Genesis chapter 6, this is just before the flood. Sin is so rampant. If he didn't restrain it, it would just been all hell breaking loose. And finally, he judges the whole world. Only six righteous, is that right? Six? Eight righteous people. Eight righteous people were alive on the earth. Uh, Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives. That's all that, that, that are remaining. But he's still restraining sin. Regeneration in John 3. We're actually in the Old Testament when he tells Nicodemus to be born again. Because the New Testament doesn't begin until he's resurrected from the dead. So he's telling this Old Testament person that he needed to be born again. So, and he regenerated in the Old Testament. People came. He indwells saints in the Old Testament and the New. He, he comes and he indwells them. In the Old Testament, it seemed that he indwelled them to empower them to do specific tasks. He indwells them. He enables them. The term is filled in the King James. He fills them, but it, 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 Modern translations, it talks about enabling them. He enables them for service. Uh, he enabled uh, them to, the Holy Spirit filled them to actually build the sanctuary, the, the tabernacle, exactly the way he wanted it. So he shaped the person who was the, the carpenters on the temple or on the tabernacle so they constructed exactly the way he needed it to be instructed, constructed based on his verbal instructions. So it turned out exactly the way he wanted it. For leadership, he comes upon them. We're going to see in the book of Judges, 3, 6, uh, book of Judges, the, the term the Judges, the Spirit of, the, of God came upon them to enable them. The most famous one is Samson. He had the Spirit came on him and he pulled down the whole house. Right. We'll, we'll see that as we go through the book of Judges. For prophetic ministry, it was the Spirit of God that then gave them the prophetic word. So he's very involved in the Old Testament. So it's not like some would say that in the Old Testament, the Father is God. During the Gospels, Jesus is God. In the New Testament, the Acts and on, that the Holy Spirit's God. That's modalism. No, he, he was God back in the Old Testament too. He's, he's, he had a ministry in the Old Testament. He, he's, he is God. Now we're going to turn to the ministry of Christ's life. In Christ's life. He ministered to Christ by his conception. It was the Holy Spirit, according to Luke 135, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you of the power of the Almighty, and you will conceive and bear forth a son. And uh, so that, that passage talking about the supernatural conception of Jesus by the Holy Spirit uh, that implanted a seed in Mary's womb. By his anointing, Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel. So he's got a Holy Spirit empowerment to preach the gospel. The Holy Spirit was involved in Jesus' life. By sealing him, John 6, 27, he was sealed by the Holy Spirit. By filling him, Luke 4, 1, he was full of the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit.
and by leading and uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit, the first thing that he did is he led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. Whoa. You mean, if I get filled with the Spirit of God, which means he takes and possesses every bit of me. Jesus is fully possessed with the Spirit of God. The next thing I'm going to get is a temptation? Probably. Probably. He's tempted for 40 days, and uh, he's tempted the whole time. We're only recorded three temptations, I think, which were at the very end. And he always rebuts the temptation. He never sinned. He re rebuts him with uh, quoting the Scriptures. Six, by empowering him. It says angels came and ministered to him, I believe also. But he is empowered by the Spirit of God in Luke 4, 14. And by raising him from the dead. Not only did he raise himself from the dead, not only did the Father raise him from the dead, but it tells us in Romans 8, 11, that the Spirit raised him from the dead. The whole triune God was at work in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The whole triune God. I got a few questions. What would uh, would you, <clears throat> how would you differentiate between common grace and efficacious grace? You kind of spelled it out. I did. I just want to get a. Few, yeah. so. the, the world around us, the thing we think of is the planet and the sun and all the stars and nature and all of that. Well, God created that. He created for everybody. For everyone. For the sun. Yeah. So. Everything that God does good that everybody benefits from is his common grace. So what is his efficacious grace? That's where he the the personal invitation pulls us to him. Yes. Following his will. When he pulls us to him, I like that. It's like uh, he's the magnet and we're the, the metal that is attracted to to the magnet. And he pulls us to him. Yeah, I like that. That's uh, that's a great definition. Good job. The Holy Spirit convicts. How would you describe his convicting someone? Or his convicting to someone? How would you describe that? Well, when I was growing up in the church in the South, we used to refer to people as saying they're under conviction. He's under conviction. Yeah. Because their life reflects a discontent with the way they were living. And yeah. we could observe it. So we waited for the day when he said, yes, I accept the Lord. We knew it was going to happen. Good, that's good. Someone else? Making making me feel uncomfortable about something I did or said. Uncomfortableness, yes. Okay. What else? Inspiration. Inspiration. What do you mean by that? Well, <coughs> you can feel it. No, oh, you, okay. You notice it. You feel it. <laughs> yeah, I got it, I got it. I, I, good. Anybody else? Conviction. I don't know if I got any more. Oh, I do. What ministry of the Holy Spirit to Jesus surprises you? There's one that just surprises me. Let him into the wilderness to be tempted. Let him into the wilderness to be tempted. That, that just surprises me. It's like, he is the Son of God. And he led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by the devil. We get this idea, if I live this wonderful you know, life journey, that there will be no problems or difficulties along the way. And that boy, and this person, man, they must have done something wrong because look at all the problems they've got. And the, the word temptation can be taken in our culture almost like the word problems, okay? And just because you got a person has problems doesn't mean that they're out of step with God. We don't know that. It might be, because he could use any problem he did for, for Jonah. He made problems arise for Jonah as ch chasing. But I don't know the purpose of those. How about Job? Did Job's problems come as a result of anything he done wrong? No. Not at all. So we should never... But it just surprises me. The Son of God has got to be led into the wilderness to be tempted. Like any common person. Like any common person. Because he is a man. Just like you and I in every regard except he had no sin. He was like the very first Adam before he fell. Wow. So, I just, that one's kind of surprises me. Anyway. Hey, the next part of our study is the Holy Spirit's ministry in the uh, New Testament uh, and believers' lives. The believers' life. So, I'm just dealing with this last section. Uh, his New Testament ministry. His New Testament ministry to, to Christians may be divided into two categories. The first one is his instantaneous and permanent ministry. 
And I got a line up here. And as soon as you're all done writing, I'm all. These are instantaneous. Boom, it happens. Boom. And then it's permanent. It has abiding results. And so if you look at the screen, it's kind of like this. Boom, and it goes on. It happens. Boom, it goes on. A person is born again. It's like your life. I was born on November 16th. Boom. And then I've been living ever since that original November 16th. I'm skipping the, the year. <laughs> <laughs> Boom, it happened, and I continue from that point, all right? The new birth is the same way. I accept Jesus Christ. Boom. And now I have the beginning of a spiritual life, a spiritual journey. It's continual, repeated ministry. Now this is quite different, whereas this happens once and it's permanent, it goes on and on and on. <clears throat> the continued, repeated one is it's not like that at all. In fact, it's more like this. And if you miss that, it's like this. <laughs> it happens over and over and over and over again. And I want to look at these two concepts. That there is a ministry of the Holy Spirit, boom, it happens once. And it doesn't repeat. And then there are those that repeat over and over and over and over again in our lives. All right? Let's do the first one. There are four works of the Holy Spirit, which only occur one time in the life of the elect. I call elect the believer because you're synonymous. You're a believer. You were chosen. You were efficaciously called. And uh, they are regeneration. I get born again one time, and I have abiding life after that. Another one is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit baptized me at that same moment, and I've ever since been part of the body of Christ. The next one is indwelling. The Holy Spirit came to live within me, and it stays permanent and continues on and on and on and on. He never leaves me. And the next one is imparting of spiritual gifts. When he gave a gift, he didn't take it back. That person had it from then on. And so we got these four major, there may be more, but these are the four that I'm aware of. And I don't think that I know it all. I sure don't. All right. So let, let's look at these. Regeneration. I want to talk about this. This is so important. Regeneration is an instantaneous act of the Holy Spirit, whereby new life is actually imparted to the one the Father has chosen and the Spirit has efficaciously called. So I got here this little scope here. This is checking the person's pulse. This guy is dead. He's on the morgue slab. But this is a spiritual slab, because in Ephesians 2 1, it says, You are dead in your trespasses and sin. Boom. You were dead in your trespasses and sin. This guy's dead. He's a dead blind sinner. He's, a, he, he's unresponsive to anything. He's the guy standing there, and, you know, he he's, might be alive physically, but he's dead spiritually. The message comes, he can't respond because he's dead. In order for him to come alive, something's got to happen. The Holy Spirit has got to. I like what one of the old Presbyterian preachers said. He's got to have a blast of the holy wind. <laughs> because of spirit means wind. The holy wind, the holy spirit. He's got to get a blast of that holy wind. And when that holy wind hits, boom, all of a sudden he comes alive. He's got life. He's been infused with life from the Holy Spirit. The first thing this person does, as soon as they're regenerated, is they believe and they repent. Both of which the Bible calls a gift. A gift of faith and a gift of repentance. They're the first things that the person who's been regenerated do. They believe and they repent. Okay. Now, John 1, 11 through 13 says this. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. So the Jews rejected him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born. Boom. I'm born. Watch. Not of natural descent. I think we talked about this a little earlier. You can't hold on to somebody else's coattails. Because my mom and dad are saved doesn't mean I'm in the family of God. I've got to get saved myself. Nor of human decision. What? I don't decide this. Nobody else decides it for me. It's not a husband's will. You know, in the ancient world, Joshua said, as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. He could force them to serve. It's kind of like the boy, you know, sitting in the corner. He said, you may have me sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. 
I can make my kids go to church, but I can't make them love Jesus. All right? I, could, I can make my spouse go to church with me, but I can't make my spouse love Jesus. I can't do that. It's children born, a person is born into God's family, have to be born of God. It's God, the Holy Spirit, that infuses life so the person believes and responds to the gospel. That's what's going on here. We go a little bit further. In John chapter 3, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter his, womb, his mother's womb a second time to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom unless he is born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You've got to be born of the Spirit for the Spirit. If you're born of the water, okay, that's fleshly birth. But born of the Spirit is a spiritual birth. It's got to come from the Holy Spirit. A lot of people, we call it decisional regeneration. They decide that they're going to be a follower of Jesus, but it was not a spiritual regeneration. Their decision is, I'm just going to reform my life. That is not regeneration. It's got to be a work of the Holy Spirit that actually changes the person's life. You should not be surprised that I say to you, you must be born again. And so that, that new birth happens one time, and then the, you, you're in the family of God from then on. You know, I have a, I have a son that has, uh, I mean, he, I became a father the moment he became a son. Right. And, and my son was what was born to me, and he could change his name. He can defy me. He can blaspheme me. He can do anything he wants like that. He will forever be my son. When I was born into the family of God, I can misbehave a lot. And my Father in Heaven will discipline me. You better believe He'll discipline me because I'm, I'm legitimate. But I can never be, I can never get out of the family of God. I've been born again. It's one, one time, instantaneous, not a process. Boom, the Spirit of God did that and I became part of the family of God. <clears throat> because of His great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions and... Uh, and transgressions, it is by grace that you have been saved. He made us alive. Remember the story? Lazarus was dead. Jesus yelled out, and Lazarus come forth. Somebody has said if they put if you put the word Lazarus in front of that, everyone would have come forth. But he said, Lazarus come forth. Listen, he made me alive. Oh Lazarus came jumping out, you know, because he's all wrapped up. He's all wrapped up. See, wrap him, unwrap him. When 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 God regenerates, we become alive spiritually. Spiritually, He saved us not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth, a new birth, and renewal by the Holy Spirit. This rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit is that holy blast of wind giving me life and changing and altering my life forever. All right. Now, the Holy Spirit uses means in this process. I know that from the Scriptures itself. First Peter says, for you've been born again, there's my word, I hope I got it underlined, I do, okay. Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the enduring word of God. I'm born again through the word of God. So God, I don't have my Bible here, it's on the front pew, but I can pick up my Bible, my Bible. God never, in, this, in the age in which we live, saves anybody without the word of God penetrating their hearts some way. The Holy Spirit uses the word of God to bring about life in that person. And so that's why, you know, I put all the verses up I can on a Sunday. Because it is the, the scriptures, the gospel is the power of God into salvation. Not any of my cleverness. It's when the Holy Spirit chooses to use his word to infuse life into somebody who's dead. And then they express faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All right, so he's a new creation. So the old, gone, new has come. That whole life has been changed. The next one is spirit baptism. I hope that clock is right, because I'm doing okay. All right, spirit baptism. Now I say spirit baptism is similar to water baptism, which is an act of a minister or somebody who's officiating body placing another person into a body of water. It goes like this. I put him into the water. 
how he spelled them for a certain fee, I'll bring you back up. <laughs> you better start tithing. If you tithe, I'll bring you back up. <laughs> All right. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> if you don't bring me back up, I can't tithe. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good answer. Then you lost them all. <laughs> Water baptism, act of a minister placing a person in the body of water to identify with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. So the person going into the water saying, I died with Jesus the moment I got saved. I'm being buried with Jesus. And when they come up out of the water, they're saying, I'm alive with Jesus. But this baptism, the word baptize means to immerse. I'm putting the person into the water. The same word baptism used with the Spirit is an act of the Holy Spirit that places the believer, the moment I accepted Jesus at eight years old, I was a believer, it placed me into the body of Christ. So here I got the body, and I got the head. We're going to see that the head is Christ, the body is the church universal. The body is uh, from the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came, they were placed, they were, the first time they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, until the day of the rapture. <clears throat> the act of the Holy Spirit places the believer. Now if you watch up here, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. There I am. I'm the believer. Eight years old. I accept Jesus as my Savior. The Holy Spirit puts me into the body of Christ, which is the church. And so I'm absorbed into the body. I'm a part of the church. I'm in with Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter, James, John, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Charles uh, Spurgeon, uh, Charles Wesley Spurgeon, uh, Warfield. I mean, you just go down the line. All, of the, all these... I'm in there with them because this has this body of Christ is from the day of Pentecost in AD 32 to whenever the rapture takes place, which hasn't taken place yet. Every believer is in that one. There's Catholics, Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists, anybody who's a believer is in there. No denomination. We're all, this is called the universal church. In the old days, it was called Catholic. Catholic just means universal because at one time, there were not all the denominations. In fact, before it was called Catholic, it was just called the Great Church. The Great Church. Okay? And so, that whole body, all right, I'm, I'm in there with that. It took place at the moment. The Holy Spirit put me into that body. As it says here, put in the body of Christ. The time of regeneration so that the believer is permanently united with Christ. I'm the body. I'm permanently united with Him as the head. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says it this way. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. One spirit into one body. Whether we're Jew, Greek, slave, or free, we are all given one spirit to drink. We all partake of the same Holy Spirit, is what he's saying. You are all sons of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ. You have clothed. There's that imagery of clothing. He's engulfed me. I'm engulfed in the body of Christ, the church. And there is neither Jew nor Greek nor slave or male or female in Jesus Christ. So this is it. I'm placed in the body of Christ. That takes place at the moment you're saved. And God placed all things under His, that's Jesus' feet, and appointed Him, that is Christ, to be the head. He's the head. Over everything for the church's sake, which is the body, the fullness of Him who fills everything. <coughs> So I'm placed, that's what the baptism work of the Holy Spirit is. It places me inside the body of Christ, the church. It's the church. Now the baptism work of the Holy Spirit unites us to Christ and his body, the church. That's what it does. It unites me to Christ, the head, and the body, which is his church. It is unique to the church age. There was no church in the Old Testament. There was no church during the Gospels. There will continue to always be a church since the day of Pentecost. But the church is at the rapture is going to be taken to heaven. There will be no church left on the earth for the tribulation period. Those are just called tribulation saints. And God deals with Israel again, the nation. Because we'll be in heaven, not on earth. That is, it's unique to the church age. It is universal among all church age believers. So it doesn't matter... If you got saved in the 1st century, 5th, 10th, 15th, 20th, 21st, you're in that same universal body. It happens only once to each church age believer. 
You only get saved one time. Now you might think, Ugh, I'm not sure that I really accepted Christ. God knows. And if you're not sure, then make it sure today. <laughs> just, I'm going to make it sure today. I want to nail this thing down for my assurance. But if you've been regenerated, you're, you've been born again, it happens one time. I didn't... My son David was only born one time. He didn't get born a second time into my family. He's been born one time. He's still my family. That's, that's just the way it works. It's the Holy Spirit's work and not ours. I, I cannot save anyone. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. He does it in conjunction with my preaching so that the preaching of the, the gospel, he uses the word of God to bring about birth, but I cannot do the work. I think it was Charles Spurgeon said, if God put marks on the elect's back, I'd pull shirt tails before I preached. <laughs> he hasn't. It's the secret decree of God who, who's, who's going to respond. But I am assured that somebody will always respond because God has promised that. Now, indwelling is the permanent residency of the Holy Spirit in every regenerate believer. Okay, I got this guy, the natural man. I use him all the time. You've seen this picture before. And then I got, woo, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes upon him. Shh. That regeneration, and he's filled them. You can't quite see it here because they got a blue background. <coughs> but now he is filled. In fact, the Holy Spirit makes the believer's body his temple. And there's his temple, a little drawing I've been using all along. The, my body, so, so God the Holy Spirit resides in me. Now, I don't know how that works, but I know it's there. In the Old Testament, he resided inside the tabernacle, later the temple. Now my body is the temple, and he's inside me somehow making his presence there that he has not made it elsewhere in the universe. Now, that just blows my mind. God is in me. He's taken a permanent residence. He lives in me. That residency constitutes the seal that we've been talking about, the Holy Spirit. God looks down, he sees, oh, there's the Holy Spirit. He belongs to me. That's my ownership. <coughs> Therefore... <coughs> The indwelling is a gift of God. It's a gift of God. You check those passages out. It's the evidence of salvation. He is the seal that I belong to Him. It's the evidence of my salvation that I'm saved. The Holy Spirit's within me. It's permanent. In 14.16, He says it's going to be forever. It's knowable. You can know. It's not that, oh, He left us ignorant. He's informed us of this. You can know that God the Holy Spirit is indwelling in you. You can know this. Alright, spiritual gifts. <coughs> Check my time. Okay, we're good. <clears throat> the fourth thing is an endowment. It happens once. A spiritual gift is the capacity or ability sovereignly, that is God bestows it by the Holy Spirit at the moment that you're regenerated to enable you, enable the recipient to accomplish God's plan. God gives a unique, special grace at the moment that you're saved. It's a capacity or an ability. I mean, we're going to look at this because it's a hard thing to nail down. There are three views of the spiritual gifts. The first view I call all present. They're all here today. The charismatic church and the charismatic movement believes all these gifts are present today. There's another view that no, some are present today, but others have ceased or stopped. They've been fulfilled. They're no longer in existence. And then there's the third view that is, no, all of these have ceased and stopped. None of these gifts are present today. <clears throat> so as we go through this, I, I want to point you in some direction here. <clears throat> Actually, there are 19 gifts mentioned in the Bible. And I think I've got them listed for you in the Romans 12, 6 through 8 passage. There's a gift of prophecy, serving, teaching, encouraging, contributing, leadership, mercy. Contributing is also known as gifts, okay? <clears throat> Depending on which translation you're using. When you go to the 1 Corinthians passage, you got wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment, tongues, interpretation. Now you look here and you might say, well, some of these, they coincide. Prophecy and prophecy. Uh, not all of them. Okay, so some, although there's 19 mentioned, uh, <clears throat> there's some overlap. In 1 Corinthians 12, <clears throat> 28 through 30, 
there's appointed gifted men, apostles, prophets, teachers, miracle workers, healers, helpers, administrators, and tongue speakers. It's not talking about the gifts, he's talking about the people that are using gifts. So, you've got to be very careful in these passages. Sometimes it's talking about a gift, and sometimes it's talking about a man or a person. In Ephesians, it's talking now about Christ-given gifts. The other ones were Holy Spirit-given gifts. Now he's talking about Christ-given gifts, which means they're not spirit, gifts of the Spirit, but they're gifts of Christ. This makes it even more confusing. All right. Some people say, oh, they're all just the same. Well, why would he say one is of the Spirit and one is of Christ if they're all the same? Maybe he's wanting to say that they're two different groups. Okay, so it does get very confusing. Among this list are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And so we got a couple of new categories that aren't in any other list, evangelists and teachers. First Peter has two different classes of gifts. Some are speaking gifts and some are serving gifts. So they, they speak about these gifts that you're endowed with when you get saved uh, as uh, these spiritual gifts and, uh, and they, they categorize them in some different ways. All right. It appears to me the gifts appear to, to involve the entire trinity. The entire trinity. You say, why would that be? Nobody ever mentioned that before. Well, in Hebrews 2, 4, it says, the Father is said to testify through the spiritual gifts. So God the Father is involved with the spiritual gifts so that whatever spiritual gift is being used, he is testifying. He's saying something, which tells me that the spiritual gifts are revelatory in design. They, give, they reveal something. The Son is said to give the gifts to the church collectively in Ephesians 4, 7. So the Father testifies, the Son gives, actually men there, to the church as a gift. The Holy Spirit is said to bestow gifts to each one in the church. And his list, and the ones he gives, are spiritual gifts. Gifts of the Spirit. <clears throat> so we got Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all involved in the giving of the gifts. In 1 Peter 4.11, it refers to two classes of gifts. Speaking gifts. He says, if anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. Now, the word for God, word of God is logia here. In the New Testament, it is only used with utterances or a revelation from God. And so what he's saying here, this person who has a speaking gift, when he speaks, it is the word of God. It's like scripture. Ooh. It's revelatory in design. All right. So, the serving gifts, if anyone serves, he should do it with strength God provides. Now, what I find here is very interesting. You do it with strength, or he's received strength necessary thereto from God, and not as of himself possessing it. Whoa, this gift is, I got an extraordinary energy power from God to do something. That's pretty powerful. Supernatural power to pull something off. All right. Paul categorizes the spiritual gifts also. Oh my goodness. This is why it's so complicated. There are two different Greek words that are used to categorize spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I got them here. The first one is alo. All right. And you look at that, you can just see it looks really different from hetero. Alo hetero. But they both are translated another in English. This word, uh, another, means another of the same kind. All right? So I got a bunch of pens here. And uh, here's one, and here's another of the exact same kind. You can look at it, the exact same kind. They're both great. Here's another, same kind, okay? Oh, here's another, ah, of a different kind. It's white. It's a different kind. Oh, I just happened to have another one of another kind that's white. Oh, yeah. Oh, another one of another, okay, oh, there we go. Oh, then I got another of another kind, oh, but it's a different kind. It's blue. You see how this works? Another of the same kind, oh, I've one gone to another of a different kind. This is really important, because when you do really serious Bible study, these little differences often make a big, huge difference. For example, in the passage on spiritual gifts, the word another is used, I think, eight times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight times. 
But what he does, he says another of the same kind, another of the same kind, and then it, whoop, another of the same kind, another of a different kind. Another of the same kind, another same kind, another same kind, another same kind, oh, another of a different kind, another of the same kind. And what he has done here in this passage, by doing that, is he's given us three categories. Now, it's hard to find this in the English text, but if you had a Greek testament or you were comparing all these words from a concordance, you would find that the another of the same kind, which I have in the purple, is class one. I call this the knowledge class, and I do that for a reason, okay? Class one. Right after that, it says, oh, to the one of the Spirit is given, is given a message of wisdom, to another of message of knowledge. Wisdom and knowledge are in class one. To another of a different kind of class, which would be class two, he's given faith by the same spirit. Oh, don't get that. They're, they're both pens. One's white, one's blue. They're both spiritual gifts. One is knowledge, one is of a different kind, okay? So by the same spirit, another of, another of the same kind is a gift of feelings. Another of the same kind is miraculous powers. Another of the same kind is prophecy. Another distinguishing between spirits. And so we got class two. I call these prophetic. Knowledge, prophetic, prophetic gifts. Then he says, another of a third kind, okay, of a different kind. So I got class one, class two, another of a different kind. Is speaking in different kinds of tongues and still another of interpretation of tongues. So I just call this class three <coughs> tongues. The reason I do that <coughs> is because Wayne Paul's going to handle this whole section. Wayne Paul handles this whole section in the next chapter, chapter 13. He says, love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, that was class two, prophecy. Prophecy is class two, which was lumped with, what were the other ones at the same time? Prophecy and? Knowledge. Knowledge? No, I think it was, well, let me back up for a second. Knowledge is one. Prophecy is lumped with most of them. Faith by the the gift of faith, the gift of uh, I got to cover it up here. Oh, I went the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Healings, faith, healings, uh, miraculous powers. It's interesting that the word miraculous powers seems to indicate the the one uh, Greek uh, commentator I, I read. Uh, he says it's the gift of miracles was you had a miracle, you had the power. Well, it was of healings, of healings. Is that in here? I think that's what this one is, healings. Healings, right there. Is that you had the gift to heal one specific thing, and not just a general blanket catch-all of the way it's all constructed. Miraculous powers, prophecy, distinguishing between spirit. This is class two, right here. And so in the section here, he says, whoa, but whether there are prophecies, they will cease, class two. Whether there are tongues, up, class three. Whether there is knowledge, up, class one. He picks one out of each one of those groupings. So he said, hey, prophecy, tongues, and knowledge. So let me tell you something about them, he says. Watch. If there's prophecy, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. King, King James says silence. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. They're all coming to an end. Will cease. Be silenced. Pass away. Pass away is actually a middle voice, and it says they will do this all by themselves. They will cease in and of themselves. Which ones? Okay, they're going to cease. It's actually, it's the tongues. The tongues is the one that says they'll cease in and of itself. But the gift point is they're all going to stop. These are not permanent spiritual gifts. These spiritual gifts are obviously uh, uh, are uh, temporary. They're not going to continue permanently. They will cease. And then he goes on and says, For we know in part, class one. Oh, knowledge. I have partial knowledge. <clears throat> we prophesy in part. Oh, class two. <clears throat> he knows, gets a message from God. He prophesies in part. But then he says, Oh, but when the perfect comes, the imperfect disappears. I believe it's the, the canon of the scripture. When the scriptures were completed, these temporary ones that he said they're all going to see, stop, or he says they will be done away because you no longer need the message from God. You've got the complete will of God, word of God, 
in your hands, it's right there for you. And so these gifts are going to cease. He says when the imperfect disappears. The imperfect. Oh, knowing in part. I got a partial knowledge, so it's not complete and full. The word, the, the word imperfect means partial revelation. When it disappears, or it will disappear, when the complete revelation has come. That's how I understand this passage. Others will understand it differently, but this way I understand it. But when the perfect comes, perfection means complete. That's what the, word, the Greek word means, is complete, mature. When the mature, complete message comes, and I think it refers to the entire revelation from God that we have in the Scriptures, when it comes, then all the imperfect, those gifts, will disappear. They're no longer needed. And then he gives an illustration of all this. He says, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became mature, a man, okay, a child is in contrast to perfection or mature, and in the verse before, the choosing the word verse before, and the word man here is, is following it. So this man refers to the mature. He's saying, hey, all these gifts were like being a child, playing with toys. But now you've got the Bible. You've got the mature. When I became a man, I put away the childish uh, things. I put, uh, put childish ways behind me. In other words, when the complete revelation of the Bible were to come, there would no longer be the need for partial revelation. The Bible was not complete when he was writing this. So it was yet to come, there would be a time when all of this would stop. It continues to illustrate, changing the metaphor, from children now to a, looking in a mirror. You got to remember, the mirror back then wasn't like ours with glass the silver on the back. It was usually really polished brass or something like that, so that you could see your reflection in. Now we see poor, a poor reflection in the mirror. Okay, so there, I got a poor reflection. He says, I look in the mirror and I got a poor reflection. Then we will know face to face. This term is used with Moses having a face to face encounter with God as a revelation. God was revealing himself face to face with him. He says, Now I know in part. Right now, I don't part because I only got a piece here, a piece there. I don't have the full canon. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. A day's coming when I got to really fully know everything. <coughs> Uh, okay, so I got now he can really see himself. And then he goes on and says, Now these three remain faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. He's saying, Hey, to the church at Corinth, you're majoring on the minors. You're majoring on the spiritual gifts when you should be majoring on faith, hope, and love. You're exalting the Holy Spirit, not the Lord Jesus Christ. You're ex exalting these spiritual gifts, not that they have the full the, the Word of God. The day is coming when you'll have that. Now, the spiritual gifts are temporary. We know that. Some of them are, at least. How shall we escape, he says, if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord. So the Lord announces salvation. It was confirmed to us by those who heard him. So the author of the book of Hebrews is saying, I'm not a first-generation Christian. I'm not... That would be the first. Here's Christ, first generation, second generation. He said, listen, I... We heard through the, the, the apostles, the prophets, about the Lord. It was first confirmed to us by those who heard him. Now watch what he says in the next verse. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various powers, miracles. That's what the word miracles means. God testified. Miracles are always revelatory in design. They're testifying, revealing new truth. And then he adds, not only is that a sign, but also the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Oh, the spiritual gifts were revelatory in design. I said, what are you getting to? Man, this is really getting complicated. I don't know where it's all going. It was clear that some of the gifts were revelatory in design, and therefore they're no longer active because we got the complete Bible. Six are usually identified as such. Apostle... Miracles, prophets, tongues, healing, and interpretation. Almost universally, everybody in the evangelical community, you know, that are non-charismatic, charismatic said they're all, all of these are valid today, but all those in the evangelical community, doesn't matter which denomination, you're in the evangelical, you take the Bible study very seriously, would identify these six 
as being revelatory of what he's talking about there, that they are no longer here. One of the qualifications of apostles, you had to see Jesus. <laughs> Wipe that one out. You know, you had to see Jesus. And uh, so, uh, but they include these. And that's why we're typically a non-charismatic church, because we're among those who would believe that these were revelatory. Now, some believe more are revelatory. They make a bigger list of which ones are revelatory in design. And some people believe they are all revelatory in design. And so the big question is, what do you believe? You're probably asking, what do I believe? I'm in a very small minority that believe that all of them are revelatory in design. All the spiritual gifts, not the Christ gifts, the spiritual gifts. But uh, <clears throat> these are the, 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 the spiritual gifts. Because I believe they're all revelatory in design, I don't, <coughs> I don't think that God is using any of these. I, I think even the one that's called teaching uh, or knowledge, all of those are revelatory in design. Uh, teaching. Here's a person who never ever went to Bible college or seminary and is in, in Bible times, like Peter, he's one day a buffoon. All he does is insert his foot in his mouth. The Holy Spirit comes upon them on the day of Pentecost, and he receives a spiritual gift of apostleship. And now all of a sudden, a guy that couldn't do anything before, he heals this guy before. Uh, you know, he speaks in tongues. He does all of this. These are supernatural. He becomes a profound teacher. Not because he went to school to learn this. God just gave it to him. Boom. I think most of the, the, the people who, uh, who deal with spiritual gift minimize how big these were. How big they were. The guy who had knowledge. The guy who had wisdom. The, 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 these were given to people who were illiterate. And all of a sudden, boom. They're scholars. That's not what we do today. People say, oh, you gotta, you got to develop your spiritual gift. That's not what happened in the book of Acts. People who never studied a foreign language, boom, they were able to speak fluently another foreign language. I believe all the gifts were like that. And so that I don't think any of them that are there are, 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 are existing today. I believe what we have today are the Christ-given gifts, which are people like pastors and evangelists, and uh, he's given people to the church. But they don't have any unique abilities because they were all revelatory in design. And the Bible is complete. It's all we need. It's a self-sufficient book. I stand like Martin Luther. Sola Scriptura. Here's the scriptures. Everything we need is in the book. All right. But I don't, I don't go around trying to condemn anybody who believes differently than I do. I have really good friends who are full-fledged charismatics, and that's fine. Okay, this is not a pillar of the faith, but I know it's an area of interest to everyone. What do we do with these spiritual gifts? All right. His continual repeated ministries. Oh, we're over time. Convicting. We've already talked about that. It's work of the Holy Spirit whereby He convicts a person beyond a shadow of a doubt that they are guilty regarding, and we've already looked at this, sin, righteousness, and judgment. The next one here is comforting. I will ask the Father and He will give you another counselor. The word is comforter. To be with you forever. The Spirit. It's actually parakaleo, parakletan. Para means alongside of, called alongside of. It's somebody that comes alongside of you when you're grieving, you're hurt. He's your comforter. All right? The Holy Spirit is our comforter. He's going to comfort us in the absence of Christ. He fills us. The filling is the work of the Holy Spirit, occupying and influencing every aspect of the believer's life. There's no vacancy. I allow the Holy Spirit to have the keys to every room in my life, to control and possess every part of me. Filling work of the Holy Spirit. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. As alcohol takes control of you, don't do that. Let the Holy Spirit take control of you. It's a whole idea of giving Him access to all of you, yielding to Him not to drink, so that He influences every aspect of your life. Leading, because those who are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. He leads us. If you're a son of God, He is leading you. The question is, are you following His leading? Fifth, teaching. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send my, in my name, He will teach you all things. He teaches us. He confirms with our spirit the things that are in the Word of God. Praying. 
the Holy Spirit prays for you. The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. He prays for us, assuring. Romans 8, 16 says, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. You should know deep down inside, yes, I've accepted Jesus, and I'm assured the Holy Spirit just prompts me to know that. Hey, thanks for attending Digging Deeper. Any questions? You got a good question. I'm going to ask my wife to answer it. Really? All right. What is the unforgivable sin? The unforgivable sin. That's a really great question. How many of you have ever asked that before? Heard that? Okay. It's called the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is in the book of Matthew. They attributed the miracle of Jesus that he performed to Satan. And he said, all sins will be forgiven you except the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. For that to take place, I believe you had to be there. You had to be there for the miracle, and then you attribute what God did to the Holy to Satan rather than the Holy Spirit. And when they did that, they blasphemed the Holy Spirit, and he was saying, your sin is now unpardonable. It's the only sin I know of. The Bible says unpardonable. I, I was thinking that it was not accepting first. That's not what the passage says. They rejected that miracle and attributed it to Satan. Mm -hmm. Check that out, Matthew. I think it's chapter 12. Other questions? You can get up and leave, too. That's all right. <laughs> Was that a question? <laughs> all right. This has been a fun series. We're going to do a second part of this next spring and then the final part next fall. Uh, the final part uh, has to do with end time, so I'm going to dedicate a whole series just for that one study.